But lawyers have been the vanguards of business and innovation ever since our democracy was formulated. There is not a single business that I know of that hasn't had a lawyer to be a part of their whole planning and strategic operations. We here at the law school with our business law and finance program are always looking for ways in order to educate the students and really our faculty about this intersection of law, business, and this other part, this innovation, this idea of how people are able to get their ideas about business in a novel way up and running and fostering. So this particular program, I think, not only carries that message forward, but it also shows under the GW umbrella how we're thinking about this and how active it is in terms of what we do with our business law and finance program. For my students out there, you should know that when I speak with employers and when I speak with alumni, when I speak with individuals who are interested in law school, the subject always comes up about why law school matters and what can individuals do with a law degree when they leave. Aside from doing the work that really goes with preserving the rule of law, anyone with a law degree has the compositive skills to really think creatively, to pivot with a market that's rapidly expanding, and to think of ways in order to take advantage of the opportunities that come up in this very complex market. Lawyers do that. And so as a result of looking at what lawyers traditionally do and looking at what lawyers actually do in terms of how they are engines for business, we also now have an opportunity to talk very specifically about how lawyers and the whole innovation in business process not only works, but is a salient part of the success of innovation in our country. I'm very pleased that we are collaborating with other activities of the Office of Innovation and Entrepreneurship headed by Lex McCulsky here, my very dear friend who has always come to the law school with all these wonderful ideas. And I'm very grateful to Jeremy Pam, who uh, directs our business law and finance program for helping to put this together and, and uh, another very good program that really shows this intersection between what lawyers do and what businesses do again. As you listen to this panel, oh, let me give one other thanks. I don't know if she's here. Is, is uh, Rennie Olafon here? <coughs> oh, there she is. Thank you so much, Rennie. Rennie, who's our fellow who's worked very hard on this as well. I wanted to really give a shout out to her because she's worked very hard on all of this. Ladies and gentlemen, as you listen to this panel tonight, one of, two things I think should happen for you. The first, it will reinforce what I've just said about this intersection between for what lawyers do and how business and innovation fits together. That's the first thing. The second thing that I hope it does for you, and particularly my students, is that it begins to germinate in you ideas about what you would like to do when you finish law school and how you would take your law degree and what you do in order to really maximize your opportunities when you leave. So many lawyers and so many individuals come to law school with a lot of ideas about what they'd like to do with their lives. But very often they think that the only thing that they can do once they graduate from law school is to practice law in the traditional way. This panel will hopefully spark in you the idea that even if you do that, even if you do end up practicing law in a very particular way, that you will always think about how lawyers are at the forefront of businesses and innovation. And when you have your own ideas about what you would like to do and go forward with it, hopefully you'll think back on this panel and what I've told you tonight so that you will be the innovators of tomorrow. So without further ado, I'm going to hand the podium off to Lex. Thank yep. you so much. Thank you. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for coming out for what I know will be a very interesting program. Thank you. Thank you. Greetings, everybody. Welcome. Glad you're here. I am Lex McCusker from the GW Office of Innovation and Entrepreneurship. I want, don't want to delay the proceedings much, but I do want to take a few minutes to make sure that you uh, are, a little, are aware of what our office does and some of the programs and resources that we offer to uh, GW students, faculty, staff, alumni, and the, and the larger community. Uh, the Office of Innovation and Entrepreneurship is not part of any school. We report to the provost. 
although perhaps better said, stated, we are part of every school. Our mission is campus-wide, and we provide uh, support resources and programming to help anyone who has an idea that, that could be realized in the form of a startup venture. We run two major activities. Uh, does everyone have one of these? This is the, the handout that we, uh, we have. Um, so take a look. I'm, I'm, I'm going to speak to this. Um, the, the biggest program we run is the GW New Venture Competition. So every spring, we, GW runs one of the largest collegiate entrepreneurship contests in the country. Uh, last year, we gave out $140,000 in unrestricted cash grants to uh, student startups. Uh, the cash prizes this year are already, uh, will total uh, at least $175,000. Uh, one of the top 10 competitions in the country. Uh, 276 people participated on 137 teams. Starts in February, uh, but it's not too soon to be thinking about how you might enter that competition. GW also is part of the National Science Foundation i program. We run a series of programs primarily for tech entrepreneurs who teach, and this program teaches the lean startup. It comes in many flavors. Uh, the one I want to uh, emphasize to you is one that's called Accelerate GW. It's a two-week course that introduces the techniques of the lean startup, uh, teaches you how to determine if there's a market for your product or service and how to go out and verify uh, that that market exists. Uh, this program also comes with a $3,000 grant. We support at least 30 teams a year uh, through this program and provide them uh, $3,000 to help them uh, pursue uh, the intelligence about the marketability of a product and service. Uh, two other important resources that you all should know about. Uh, one is the Mentors in Residence. Uh, we have seven uh, experienced entrepreneurs, investors who come to campus two to four hours a week. Uh, we stagger their schedules so that they are um, on camp. At least one is on campus every day, and they hold office hours. Uh, they hold them around campus, some in the, the library, uh, some in the Multicultural Student Center, uh, some in the Innovation Center, the Seas Innovation Center over on in Tompkins Hall. But these are very bright, personable, uh, experienced people who can answer any question you might have about uh, any really any aspect of entrepreneurship. And finally, there's the Innovation Exchange. We run an online community of mentors and mentees um, that uh, allows that has over 200, 225 mentors at the last last count. These are again experienced business people who have volunteered to connect with with you online. Uh, it's very easy to go into the Innovation Exchange. You fill out a, a quick profile, and then you can essentially pose questions to the community um, about really any aspect of entrepreneurship and safe bet the two, three, four, five uh, candidates who know something about that and have already said they want to talk to you will pop up in the, in the, on the platform, and you can just ping them and set up a, a call, uh, Skype, or uh, meet them for Star at Starbucks for coffee. So those are some of the key resources. All of our resources are listed on our website, which is innovation.gwu.edu. Finally, let me draw your attention to some programming that we have coming up. Um, specifically, um, we have a human design, human-centered design workshop on October 15th next week. Um, we have on October 17th, our friends from Hatch are coming in uh, to deliver a workshop called So You Need an App, <clears throat> What You Should Know Before You Start. Uh, this, is a, this is a fascinating program. If any of you think you have an idea that might be realized in a, in a mobile app or a, or a web app, uh, Hatch will show you how to do that very easily. You don't need to be a program, programmer to use the Hatch tools to make an app. Um, and then <clears throat> the last thing I want to point out to you is November 2nd through 4th, we're running a, a boot camp, a three-day boot camp with our friends at SeedSpot. This is an intensive uh, over-the-weekend activity where anybody with an idea for a social impact venture, a venture that, that uh, strives to do well, uh, do good as well as do well, um, our friends at SeedSpot will put you through a, a, a crash course and try to move you up the learning curve uh, very efficiently. So lots of good programs, lots of support resources, um, lots of activities that you can engage in. We love law students to participate um, for all the reasons that these, uh, these folks will talk about in a few minutes. Um, law students make great entrepreneurs. They make, they, they are, make great innovators, and they always have something to contribute to any team, whether it's one they start or one they just join. So thank you very much. And with that, I will turn the 
platform over to uh, Jeremy, who will uh, introduce our panelists. Thank you. Thanks very much, Lex. Uh, one of the objectives uh, for uh, this event tonight uh, was uh, to give a platform, uh, particularly to the law students here, uh, to uh, all of the great work that GW's uh, central office of innovation and entrepreneurship um, is doing. And as Lex noted, uh, that work, uh, which I think is it, it, it's a it's a particularly useful and commendable uh, structure, which is not the case at every university. The work that uh, and the resources that Lex has just described uh, that the Office of Innovation and Entrepreneurship does are available to all students, to students of all schools, including law school, including this law school. And so um, I'm delighted that you, uh, that those of you who are law students and who may not have encountered it before have now heard something about it. Um, and of course, I'm delighted that uh, we're going to have a fascinating discussion uh, with three uh, experienced uh, lawyers uh, uh, to, who, who have a wealth of experience working on uh, uh, working for, providing uh, advice to, working on transactions uh, uh, with um, a wide range of companies um, from startup to uh, uh, emerging growth to uh, 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 at the scale that uh, a giant company might be interested in acquiring them. And so I think we've got a, a great wealth of experience on the panel today, and I think we're going to have uh, a very interesting discussion. Uh, you should all have uh, the bios of our three uh, speakers, our three panelists, uh, with you, so I'm not going to uh, repeat that. Um, but let me just note uh, a couple of things, a couple of uh, sort of common themes or and distinctive themes that uh, uh, jump out to me, uh, starting with Steve Kaplan uh, to my left. Uh, he's at Pillsbury, um, and uh, his work uh, uh, makes a point, his, his, the bio makes a point of noting that he works with uh, companies at every phase, from building, growing, operating, and eventually selling successful businesses. So uh, one of the things that underscores the fact that one of the interesting things about this kind of practice, uh, advising uh, 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 startups and emerging and high growth companies, is that you get an opportunity to see uh, companies go through multiple phases. Uh, turning uh, to Derek Kala next to him, uh, Derek is at the Cooley firm. Uh, and similarly, his practice focuses on representing high growth companies, uh, again, from formation through exit, uh, such as uh, 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 with an IPO or a sale to uh, a bigger company. Um, and uh, it, it's also interesting that his work includes fintech, <coughs> blockchain, insure tech, ed tech, um, and uh, anyone who can define all of those uh, immediately gets a special prize at the door. Um, in all seriousness, there's a, a, a wide variety of interesting cutting-edge technologies that, uh, uh, that Derek and this kind of practice exposes, uh, exposes him to. And finally, uh, uh, Anthony Millen, uh, of course, uh, our GW alum. Uh, welcome back, Anthony. Uh, he is at Shulman Rogers. And again, his work covers the, the full range of uh, uh, company stages, from startup to early stage to emerging growth, um, uh, does, does work with angel and institutional investors. Um, and uh, uh, it's interesting that he, at Shulman Rogers, he's the chair of the Startups and Emerging Growth Companies Practice Group and of the blockchain practice group. And so for those of you who may have an interest in a particular kind of uh, new technology or new uh, business area, I think uh, this panel and this kind of practice um, is, is uh, the, the kind of practice that gives you exposure, constant exposure to uh, uh, the changing uh, uh, landscape. So with that, uh, rather than taking up any more time, let's 
uh, uh, turn to the panel discussion. And thank you again for coming. So just by way of format, I'm going to pose a couple of questions to and ask each of the panelists to, uh, to speak to them. Um, and then I want to make sure we have plenty of time for open questions from the floor. My guess is that your questions will be more interesting than mine, but maybe not. So let's start. First question is a bit of a softball, but uh, let's see if you can hit it out of the park. So how, how do lawyers support the creation of, of new, high-growth, innovative, high-tech companies? And let's go alphabetical order, I guess. So Derek, you're first. Yeah, sure. Um, so look, there's the legal work, right? You need to set up an entity if you're starting a company um, for a lot of different reasons. Um, and you want to sort of get yourself on the right trajectory early on. Um, part of as a lawyer, you, you tend to be connected to a lot of people in the ecosystem because you work with a lot of different companies. So you can also help people with investors. You can help people with potential co-founders or just sort of strategic advisors in that way. Um, and then sometimes it's just helping people know the process, right? Like a lot of people starting a company for the first time have no idea what it's like in terms of, you know, when do you raise money? Um, what do you need to raise money? What do you do first? And just sort of having a general knowledge of the market, we're, we're sort of in a position to help people know, you sort of bring them into the club. Like the tech community is, is fairly small and there's sort of rules and protocols that people just, you wouldn't know from being on the outside and we can sort of bring people into that ecosystem so that, you know, they, they sort of do things the right way in the way that people are expecting. Great. I don't know the alphabetical order. Am I next? You yeah. Know, okay. Sorry, Steve. Yeah, you're next. Yeah. That's the question that's good to go first on. That's, uh, that's, that's pretty much what we do. I mean, I'll, I'll add some variants to it and maybe kind of some of why that ends up being true. And I often think about why this is the case because it's not always obvious to me why. But amongst the advisors, big companies end up having a lawyer, an accountant, a finance advisor, an investment banker, all those things. The lawyers are always in there first, um, in part because you know the formation. You know, we, we do that, but for startup companies, typically they will have a full service law firm like ours involved with them from the very beginning. They might not have a big accounting firm for years. They might not have a big investment bank ever. So a lot of times you are the one kind of professional advisor that they're leaning on, and that and because of that, you're advising them on things that like Eric was saying that are are not legal at all. I mean, they are, you know, meeting investors. That's what an investment banker does for a bigger company. But these companies don't have investment bankers. We know investors, so we can make those introductions. Um, just advising them when things, you know, the number of times I'll have an entrepreneur just say, I've never done this before. What do I need to do? And he's not asking for what protections do I need in the contracts? Or, you know, what, what's legal compliance that I need to do? It's really what do I need to do at a very high level? And we get to be a part of that conversation. I mean, it's, it, I feel like sometimes I'm a, I don't know if it's psychiatrist or psychologist, but I feel like my clients are on my couch and I'm walking them through big life decisions. Um, you know, do I, someone's offered to buy my company for $1 million. Another person's offered to give me an investment so I can try to build this to a billion dollar company. What do I do? I mean, I've had that conversation. I'm sure you all have too. You know, at least dozens of times, if not more. Um, and so you get to grow with them through that process, advise them on things that are totally outside of your education, outside of what you know anything about. But you, you've seen it before. You, they haven't. You've been there, and you really get to be a part of that process with them. Great. Great. Andrew, so, <clears throat> yeah. I, I've had an opportunity to be in multiple environments, so I've co-founded several companies, and I'm a general partner in a seed stage venture capital fund in addition to working with startup and emerging growth companies from a legal perspective. So, I've, But I would say across all those different roles, the biggest impact that you can have as a, as a working with startups is in that, that lawyer working with early stage startups, just like my colleague set up here. I think that you not just from the legal side and the strategic side, but you really, for early stage companies, are on a day-to-day -day basis interacting with founders of the company, and you have an ability to, to really impact trajectories of these early stage companies. And 
Um, I, I think that of all the different roles you can have and the kind of impact you can have when you're in there first and you're in there early as an attorney, um, and on just a daily basis, you, you can have tremendous, tremendous impact in driving the success and helping companies de-risk on their pathway forward. Alexa, if, if I may, let me, uh, before we, we, we turn to the next question, uh, maybe I can sort of flip this question uh, and, and uh, uh, see if, if uh, we can prompt uh, uh, some further thoughts about it. You, you guys chose, each of you chose this practice area. Uh, I guess the first part of my question is, does this practice area, do you think that this practice area working with, with new and newer, young and younger, uh, companies provide you with more exposure to innovation, innovative business models, uh, exciting things than you might have had in a in a more traditional, uh, you know, sort of classic big firm practice that uh, many of the law students in the audience are probably familiar with as a kind of default. Is, it, is, is there more exposure to innovation? And I guess the second part is, was that to what extent was that? If, if so. To what extent was that part of your motivation, and, and, and to what extent has that been one of the factors that's kept you in this practice area? Yeah, I'm happy to start with the next year. I, I was telling you a story earlier where I said I ended up in the right place for the wrong reasons, and this is another example of that, different than what we were talking about. I got into working with this because I liked gadgets growing up. I, I tell the joke that will date me for a little bit, but I was in college. I went to the Circuit City, which dates me initially, because that's now closed, but to wait in line for the first TiVo when it came out. I was so excited for it, I'd heard about it. There was no line, no one else had heard about it but me, but I thought it was gonna sell out, so I went over there. But I, I love that kind of stuff. Like I used to enjoy the day when I moved to a new you know, dorm room and I got to install my stereo again. That was fun for me. So I was like, I wanna do tech stuff, because I, I like innovation and I like tech and I like gadgets. Um, that was wrong for two main reasons, one, Gadgets actually aren't, I mean, we, I'd love to say I've worked for a gadget company. I have. My clients do like software for big enterprises and all this other, and I've, I'll tell my clients, I've never sent a tweet. I don't use social media. I'm not that kind of, in, like I'm not in tech of that way, and certainly I can't write any code. Um, so it was wrong for that reason. But the other reason it was wrong is that actually isn't why I like this. It's not the innovation as much as it is the innovative people that I like working with in the build, the company building process that I like being a part of. It, it is a side benefit that sometimes, but not always happens, that sometimes what my clients do is, is interesting. But sometimes I don't even know what they're doing. And I don't, and I care a little, I don't know completely at all what they're doing, but I really care about being part of that process of going from a few people, building a business, living those decisions with them about when do you double down, when do you hire more people, when do you, when do you de-risk versus increase risk. And so I, I, I certainly do get exposure to innovation. I think that's interesting, and I, I do still find that stuff interesting. But if you really want to deal with, like, cutting-age ideas, you know, IP law is probably where you're actually – that's more relevant to what you're doing. You're dealing with the innovative ideas. I'm touching them. I'm in the boardroom hearing about them. But my day-to-day -day is really working on the business building part and working with innovative people to help them innovate. Um, which is much more rewarding to me than actually understanding what they do. Yeah. Um, so, so I was a software developer before going to law school. Um, but uh, I was a software developer in the early 2000s when people basically thought they were all going away. Um, which is just hilarious to me now. There was like five computer science graduates in my whole class. Um, but anyways, so, so I went to, to law school to kind of buy time to figure out what I wanted to do. And then, um, and then sort of I wanted to start a company, wanted to be a founder, so it's a, you know, it was a natural practice for me. In terms of innovation, um, at least at Cooley, there's a lot happening right now because you are simultaneously having pressure to raise rates and deliver more value at lower cost, right? So a tremendous amount of our job is becoming automated and, and delivering more value for the same amount, right? Um, so for instance, like when I started, when you wanted to draft a new document, you would find something similar or a couple documents that were similar, and you sort of put them together, you know, and you sort of create one that was customized for this client. 
Um, we still do that a little bit, but it's, it's getting more rare. Like now, like there are um, basically contract generators where you, um, you input information and it creates like a suite of documents that you need for that deal. And then they regularly get updated when anything changes or you find bugs and things like that. And a big part of, especially in our summer associate program, is helping having people, it's not hard code, but it's, you sort of, if you know a little bit of code, you know how to sort of tag things. But it's building these generators, bug checking these generators, putting on the extra additions to that. So um, the, the practice of law is changing a lot. Like I think the, the leverage model is going to come down significantly. Um, but hopefully we'll be able to continue to raise rates and that sort of everything sort of stays the same. So I think, look, if you... In Other than it's harder to get jobs. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, there's that. Um, but, but like, look, in other words, whatever you sort of like to do, you'll, you'll tend to still do. I think when, when you're in a big, large organization, there's things like that. Like, because I like to code, I tend to do things like that. So you'll, you'll find yourself gravitating to those sorts of things, I think, regardless of, uh, of where you do. I mean, there's innovative stuff in all sort of different practice areas. I mean, other than like wills and estates, I think everything is changing and doing sort of interesting things. I mean, it just, just before we turn to Anthony, uh, uh, it, it, I think we have a natural impulse to sort of equate innovation to tech, uh, because that's the sector of the economy where that word is used most often. But of course, there are there is innovation in drafting. There's innovation in legal technology. Um, and another area that I think uh, that I imagine uh, you have more exposure to, particularly in your counseling of companies throughout, you know, at the at multiple stages of their journey is innovative business models, right? So, you know, I, I have a business degree as well as a law degree. And, and when I was in business school, it was impossible to, relatively recently, it was impossible to make it through a day without hearing someone say the phrase, Uber for X, right? And... Five years ago, maybe five years ago, certainly ten years ago, the the idea of Uber for cars for for people ten years ago it was living no social for X. Yeah, but um, yeah. So so uh, you know business models. Uh, when when I'm asking you about sort of your interest in innovation and whether this gives you more exposure to innovation, it it, it that certainly includes tech um, in all it, its varieties, but but it's not limited. To, uh, but it also includes business models. It includes nonprofits as well as for profits. Yeah, so, <clears throat> you know, my view is um, this is ground zero for where innovation happens, whether it's new technology or new business models. <clears throat> Startup companies are, are are where it where it starts, where most of your innovation comes from. And being in a practice working with startup companies is, I think, the most exciting thing you can do. Um, and what you're seeing even now, I think big corporations, you're seeing more and more corporate venture funds because big companies see that the real breakthrough ideas are coming from early stage startup companies. So I think starting or working with this type of client exposes you not only to innovation, it exposes you to the full range and full cycle of a business from the idea through adding the first employees, you know, you're going through the life cycle of, of the company with your clients. So I absolutely think there's no other, I, I don't think there's a better place to get exposure to the inner workings of people who are creating new businesses, new technologies, new business models, new ideas, new biotech, than working in this type of a role. So let's go back. We've talked in general about the role of, of that attorneys play with high tech and high growth companies. Get, this, this is a toss up. Anybody can answer this one. Give me some. Give me some examples. I'd like to hear something from your personal experience where you've created value, at, added value to a to a to an early stage startup. I mean, I th I think it happens. It happens every single day. So from the moment somebody comes in and they're looking at. Um, how to protect how to protect their new property their new intellectual property their new invention their new creation you you working with them on how to protect that from the legal perspective if somebody's looking to get capital there's all different there's whole ranges of strategies for how to raise capital 
who to raise it from, how to structure the deal. So you're involved in that whole discussion with them about not just the legal documents, but the strategy of, of how you go about raising a round of capital, how you build the momentum in the round, how much to raise, what to raise it at, all those decisions for like with my colleagues up here have said, if you've never done it before, um, is you're helping make those, you're really helping guide on those types of decisions. You're helping um, clients as they're making decisions on how to, as they scale in their business, you're touching, you're touching employment, you're touching intellectual property, you're touching the financing side of the business. Um, the, we've spoke, we spoke about just on day one, the formation and, and the structure that you choose. You're working with your lawyer to make decisions on that. And then as business, as business lawyers with early stage companies, there's the whole business side of what comes up and it. Half the conversations that you're having with an early stage growth company with it, and the, the founders of that company are very business oriented. There's a lot of decisions that are being made that people are looking for guidance on as well. So I, I think that every, it touches every aspect of the, of the business. Um, yeah, so for us, uh, or at least for me, last year was sort of the, the height of the ICO craze. And um, there, there was this big problem. Can you, can you define that? Great. Yeah, it was an initial point offering. It was sort of um, basically what happened is Bitcoin um, went up in value significantly, and then Ethereum went up in value significantly. And Ethereum basically allowed people to create their own coins in a very easy way, right? Like you didn't have to have a lot of experience. You didn't have to create your own blockchain. You could just create an application and use that to sort of create your own cryptocurrency, right? So there was an explosion of interest in this space. And the problem was these companies, are, are, they're, they're really kind of open source companies. And traditionally, right, it's really hard to fund an open source protocol company, right? Like that's why they're often nonprofits. I think about like Mozilla, the browser, um, Wikipedia, right? Like they, they sort of okay, but they're not usually great businesses. The idea here was you would you would have to have basically a, a token or a cryptocurrency to be able to use the product, right? And that was the whole idea. That's why there was a crazy amount of money going into the space. The problem was um, there's there's securities laws, right? And there's a lot of uncertainty as to whether at least a year ago whether these things were securities or not. And people kind of knew that. Bitcoin was probably not a security, right? Because it sort of worked, it was a thing. But also like, if something didn't work at all and you're just buying it because you think it's gonna go up in value a lot, that's probably a security. Um, so it, it was hard to get from having nothing and wanting to raise some money to build something to having something that wasn't a security. Um, so one of the things that, that we and other law firms did was put out different ideas for how you could do that, right? How can you buy something that's security and eventually hopefully get to a place where it's no longer security? Um, and, and it was, um, there was a lot of, a year ago, there was a tremendous amount of demand for lawyers in the space because there was so much uncertainty and people were sort of figuring out how to fund these new businesses. Um, now basically the SEC just said, no, stop. Um, and, you know, it moved offshore and it sort of moved into different things in the US, but at the time, it was very unclear about how it was going to go. And, and the US is one of the only places where they said stop. Like other jurisdictions around the world have built these new models. And um, you know, there's more investment going into companies in these different jurisdictions because of it. So we'll sort of see what happens in the US. But it was a time when the lawyers were really critical to how the industry was going to evolve because it's such a regulated industry. Uh, I have a story I like telling kind of represents why I like the kind of law I do. And I'm trying to figure out how I can make it an answer to this question. Um, and I, I, think, I, mean, I think what I'm going to say is the thing I like doing to add value to my clients is kind of help them relax, help them you know, sleep at night. You hear lawyers say, you know, we, we help the board sleep at night. Um, so the, the story kind of gets to that. But it really just gets all the things I like about the role I play. So I was working with a entrepreneur who I'd been working with for he actually formed one company, I like to say, lasted about six months, which is about five months longer than it deserved to last. But then he started another company that is still going now. It's, this was five years ago he first started it. We helped him raise a small round of money, he kind of was building this business. And he was finally about to raise, I think it was like an $8 million you know, capital raise. And 
he really wanted, he had been told, his investor told him we're going to get this deal done by, by this was, it was a Friday, but, you know, weeks before. They we're going to get it done by this day. We're going to get it, and that, that day keeps coming. And I kind of tell, kept telling my client, like, look, your deal is going to get done, but it's not going to be this Friday. There's still too much to do. It'll probably get closed middle of next week. And so he sends me a text on Friday afternoon basically saying, what can I do to get this deal done today? And I texted back to him, if I don't see you in a picture holding a drink in the next 30 minutes, I'm going to tank your entire deal. And I tell that story because it brings up three things I love about my practice. I text with my clients. They're my friends. Like These are people like I, I, I socialize with. It's not, I don't send memos. I've never sent a memo. Right? I don't do that. That's not part of my practice. I don't always, I, I send emails more than texts. I don't think it's something I'm just you know, practicing law 140 characters at a time. But, <laughs> um, but it is, it's an informal practice, right? Second, I get to mess with my clients, right? I can, you know, I have that relationship. You kind of get to, you know, say things like that. They know it's kidding. But like, most importantly, I get to tell my clients, don't worry, I've got this. Like, I, I'm handling this deal for you. You can relax. It's in my court nail. And he sent me a picture holding a drink, and he knew it was going to get closed. It got closed the next Wednesday. But that's when you work with someone over a long period of time. You add value by being that trusted person that tells them, this is how it's going to play out. Let me do my job. It's going to work out. And that, for someone whose life is risk, I mean, they are, you know, that's what, you know, an entrepreneur is a person who builds a risky business. That's by definition, or else it's not an entrepreneur. There's no risk to it. Um, so that, that's what they do. And if you can take some of the risk off them and say, don't worry, you know, your, your tech still might not work. Your customers might all fire. Your employees might all quit. But at least on this one point, it's in my court, and I'll take care of it. I love that role. I think they really appreciate it. And I think you add a lot, to take it back to the question, you add a lot of value to your clients when you can do that. And, and I think we would, we would be failing to uh, take note of the elephant in the room if we didn't note the, the sartorial reflections <laughs> of the more informal nature of working with uh, emerging companies. You'll find that most of your colleagues, you know, I'm speaking for gentlemen's clothes, will keep a, a coat and a tie over their door in case they have a meeting. Like they can pull it out and throw it on. Um, for us, we have to keep a pair of jeans over our door just in case we have a meeting. You never know. A client might call us and I might be wearing a suit. And so better change. Or else, you know, so you're saying you were, you were wearing a suit three hours ago? No, I, I'm saying, saying I wear jeans every day. You had to come here I just, informal? I frankly just tell that story to my more senior colleagues who get mad at me without wearing jeans. I'm like, look, I might have a meeting today. Um, but it is, I, think it is, I think that's important. That aspect of the relationship is, is a really important one. And I think that... You, you you are on call a, and it, it, you're on call a lot. I mean, cl my clients the same. Every, all of my clients, they have my cell phone. I'll get calls when something really critical is happening in the business. The founders are sitting in the office at 10 at night and something comes up and they've got to make a decision on it. So you're, you're in the flow that when, the, when, they, when they're hitting that wall and they want some guidance or reassurance or something, that's who they're calling. And um, I, do, I do think that it, it is a very relationship-driven practice. And that is a very, I agree with you, it's like a very rewarding aspect of it. So when startups need you the most, they can least afford you. Let's talk about innovations. Uh, Jeremy brought up business models. How, how can the legal profession support cash strapped startups who desperately need your warm relationships yeah like they, there's two ways I mean one is you just increase productivity or, or you give away things for free right like we have a site where we give away a ton of form documents for free um, like NDAs um, you can sort of go to the company you can form a site it doesn't cost anything and the reason we do it is because you realize it's not the forms where the value is it's knowing how to fill them out um, and then, we, so we, that's one sort of way is you just sort of make information more available and let people take it. Part of it is the productivity aspects I told you about. So like when, when you have software that can automate a big part of your job, or things that paralegals and junior associates used to do, you can do it for a lot cheaper because it takes a lot less of your time. Um, look, the other things that, that people in the industry do a lot, I, I don't do it a lot myself, but, but a lot of people do is they just defer fees until a company raises money. 
Um, so there's a lot of people that it's, it's like a contingency practice in that way where you're, you're, it's almost like a VC. You're sort of making a bet that this company will raise money and that you'll eventually get paid. Yeah, another, that just gets to your first point, I think one of the biggest ways that we almost don't think about every day, but it is the biggest cost saver, we sta the, the whole industry is standardized. We've gotten to the point if, you know, whether I'm representing the investor investing in one of, you know, their clients or vice versa, we get on the phone at the beginning, we kind of agree at a high level, we're going to aim for the middle, we're going to agree to kind of a set of often you know, standardized form documents. The, the structures have been simplified and sometimes that means they're suboptimal, but optimal is too expensive. Right? When, when we form companies, the reason we can have automated generators and forms and things like that is not because every company is the same. Because we're telling people, this is not perfect, but it works, and it's basically free or really cheap. Perfect would be very, very expensive. And so a lot of times what we're doing is counseling our clients just to go down the beaten path. Um, and that's, it, it, it's like, it's, it's simultaneously the best advice and a little bit of lazy advice, but it's, it's. True. Like that, that is the way to make this practice work a lot of times at the early stage is you keep things very simple. You keep things very standardized. You know, I, I, I tell my startups, I have two basic rules of working very early stage companies. One is to keep things as simple as possible. And the other, I call it spend your money slowly on legal fees. And that's, I, I, I translate that to don't come to me and say, well, I'm going to raise $5 million and I'm afraid I'm going to get diluted. So therefore, I need to have super voting stock so that I can keep control and you know all these things. I'm like, all right, we'll deal with that then. Nail, let's just get you set up as plain vanilla as possible. We can solve that problem later. You don't, you know, again to all my clients, that 90% of startups fail in the first six months unrelated to their legal documents. And there is zero salvage value. There's not, like, maybe you can sell a little bit of code, maybe you can sell back your computers, whatever, but you just it's a sunk cost completely. So Spend, you know, do that when you need it. And a lot of that is counseling people. And I have to use the line all the time. Like, I'm the person you'd be paying. And I'm telling you not to do it. So that should resonate with you. I'm not giving you back. Like, it's advice against my self-interest. I think that's, um, what class is that? Uh, evidence. evidence. You learn, yeah, yeah, you learn evidence. Evidence 101. So, yep, exactly. That, um, but you know, and I, you, that is how you make it work a lot of times. is by not making it unique and custom completely even if that would be slightly better, the marginal cost isn't worth it. So for me, I, I had, the, I had um, the experience of being a consumer of legal services, yeah. working with a number of the large national law firms, like at least six different large national law firms, and um, for, the, for some of my companies. And you know, found that the challenge that you're talking about just really experienced that challenge. Like, how do you have predictability? Was responsible for managing a PL. I had to know where every dollar was going and how do you manage that PL and how do you have sort of um, some sort of predictability around what you're doing. So we're, you know, I think like every industry is looking at new ways and new business models and new ways to do things. We're, do, we're doing the same thing um, with startup and emerging growth companies looking at how to leverage technology, which is being talked about, which I think is going to dramatically change the legal field in the next five years, and how to change business models, how to give people fixed prices the way other industries have done it around more and more complex services. You know, it's complicated to figure out how to do it, but we're, we're working on broad ranges of services that will be offered in predictable fixed price structures for startup and emerging growth companies. Um, you know, I, I don't believe in the defer. I think the defer model is very challenging. I tried it as an entrepreneur. It's a very challenging model when the deferral period ends. And um, I don't think anything should be given, you know, the just, it's, you need to have value on both sides of the equation in terms of things being totally free. Um, but I do think that there are better models that are more aligned for startup and emerging growth companies. And I think over the next five years, you're going to see a, a, a lot of shift in the marketplace to more and more of those types of models. And you know, it's something we're doing. So two follow-up questions, one more serious than the other. Uh, first, in light of your story, Derek, uh, am I right in assuming that you did not accept uh, uh, the prospect of an initial coin offering as payment? I no, hope not. But, uh, not <laughs> Good. 
Uh, it's all about that. Then more seriously, um, how about equity? Um, I, I, I know during the, the dot-com boom, there were some law firms, particularly on the West Coast, that, you know, that made out uh, quite well by accepting equity and all the companies that are now, you know, household names. Yeah, no, we were opposed to trial of that. Um, you, uh, you can't pay your bills on equity, right? You can't pay your assistants, you can't pay your paralegals, you can't pay your associates of equity. So I, I don't think a lot of, um, a lot of firms will take equity in lieu of fees anymore. We'll often invest, right? Um, most of the firms have a fund um, and we'll make investments in our clients. We, we were talking about how that can be challenging, right? Because you sort of, it's like choosing between your children, right? Yeah, that's the exact analogy I always use. Um, but um, yeah, like, you know, sometimes we, we, you try to figure out different things, but it usually comes down to investments and uh, it's usually pooled. I mean, the nice thing about fund is it's not your decision as an individual partner. You can say, hey, I'll, I'll check with the fund, but it's other people making the decision. So, uh, you know, look, we've... So you let someone else decide which of your children get money. Someone else decides it. <laughs> I mean, look, we've, we've done okay. I mean, I've seen, like, the historical returns. They were great in the early 90s. They're sort of okay now. Um, Wilson Sonsini has done historically exceptionally well um, with their investment funds. Mm -hmm. But um, it's also hard, like, it sort of creates a little bit of a break in the relationship if you're really trying to force yourself into a good round. And then if you're in it, and then are you participating when things aren't going well? It can put you in a really bad situation in a lot of different ways when you have equity directly as a service provider. I never want to be in a position where I'm thinking about a client's decision based on my how it's going to affect my equity, right? I, I, I want, and that's one of the, so it's, it's, it's for all those reasons, but I, I think it does create some potential misaligned incentives. Um, and so therefore we, we, we have historically done it. We don't, I, I don't do it at all. I think my firm has largely stopped doing it. Um, I think we still have some investments still, but not any kind of equity. I've got one cryptocurrency I'd love to take tokens and they offered them to me, but the problem is getting rid of them. <laughs> right? Because you can take them and then how are you going to sell them? Yeah, you're always an insider. It's, it's hard to sell. You're an insider, but also it's like if it's security or not, security in the U.S., but it's not outside the U.S., so like. You can tell somebody, you know, get your securities into Singapore, and it's fine, but it's different if you're doing it yourself. Yeah. I, I also, I do not take equity. I find that it, there is either a conflict or a perception of conflict, which sometimes creates a conflict in and of itself. And if you own equity in a company <clears throat> and you're being asked to help guide an entrepreneur on is this the time to exit? Should they double down? Should they take on another round and go for the next set of milestones? Is my kid going to college? And you, you know, you don't want somebody thinking that you're in there saying, "Wow, this would be a good time to exit. I could yeah. use that now." So just that that conflict of putting you not a hundred percent aligned with your clients on all fronts, I think, is challenging. So I'm mindful of time, and I want to give the audience a chance to ask questions, but I want to just close the formal questioning with a topic that everybody has touched on, and it's the issue of innovation within the legal firm. Um, I, I saw an article recently in the MIT Tech Review saying that artificial intelligence has replaced, already placed 100,000 100, white-collar jobs and went through a whole list of things that, that, law for, that, that AI can do that lawyers and paralegals and first-year associates used to do. Tell me about what you see as the future of innovation within the legal firm. Yeah, I'll, the answer is I don't know is, is the honest answer. I mean, I think, I think the ratio of work to judgment is going to continue to go down, right? And I think that's already, if you look at the legal practice compared to, say, the accounting practice, the number of people on a project compared to the senior people supervising it is much higher. And leverage, right? That's what we talk about leverage, how many junior people are working on a matter. It'll be, it's already happening. Technology is only going to accelerate it. Um, but you're going to see more, it's going to be more important to have the judgment than it is to do the work, um, which luckily that's what you're learning. And that's what law schools teach you is judgment, actually. Being worked with lots of junior associates, they, they do much less teaching you like the actual work skills. They teach you the judgment, but that's a good thing. I think that is what's going to be more important for lawyers. Um, and then the 
stick with my trend of kind of answering a different question when I kind of want to make a point. There's one more point before we, that we haven't brought up that I think is critical. We, we talk about innovation in our practices, and, and I mentioned that entrepreneurs are risk takers. The other thing entrepreneurs are are hustlers, and that's the other thing entrepreneurial lawyers are. Entrepreneurs lawyers are. Our practices are scrappy practices. We, we don't do... We spend a lot of time doing work that really isn't legal work. We spend a lot of time going out and file. My clients either get sold or they don't file bankruptcy, go bankrupt. Um, you know, on a handful of year cycle, right? The, the, the half-life is short. We have to constantly be going out and networking. We have to constantly be, you know, a fourth-year lawyer in our practices or thinking about these questions like deferrals and whether or not to take equity in a way that in lots of practices a person who's been a partner for 10 years is never thinking about that. You know, they, they, there's someone more senior than them is doing those problems. So it is, it is the kind of practice that, and again, technically it's innovation, but it's, it takes a hustling personality, a kind of willingness to, to innovate, and, and not in a tech way, but in a how you think about building a practice, how you think about serving your clients, and it requires doing it very early. I mean, it's, this is a young man's game. I mean, it's a, it's a game that younger lawyers can really get involved and build a practice in a way that I give the example of the year I made partner. It, one of my, someone who's on the same floor as me is in our nuclear regulatory group. The year I made partner, all the work I did was for clients that I had kind of built the relationship with. It'll be 25 more years before she's the most senior partner on matters because you don't hire a young nuclear regulatory lawyer. You hire, like, there's first only like 20 of them in the country, but you hire really senior, experienced people. You bet the company litigation. You're hiring more experienced people. Startups like people that they can relate to, that, you know, and age isn't the only reason. I don't want to make it just about age. It's about, you know, hustle is the best word I can think of. And I do think that's a defining characteristic of this practice more than almost anything else. Yeah, I mean, look, leverage is going to go down. Um, it's just you're, you're being replaced, like the low-value work with software. So it's going to be harder um, to get to be like an associate or paralegal on these things. What I would say is what we're seeing over the last few years, where there's the biggest gap in the market, where we really like have struggle hiring, is regulatory lawyers that know how to work with the disruptive early-stage companies. Like it's really, really hard to find healthcare regulatory lawyers, like financial services regulatory lawyers, insurance regulatory lawyers that like are not like just stuck like not. They get have a hustle. That understand yeah, like that, that, that part sort of the have game. that yeah. um, ability to work and sort of scale working with different levels of companies. And I, I think that the demand for those services is going to continue to go up because. You really need it, and most of the innovation is going into these sort of regulated industries. I mean, even Uber, right? Like people think of it as a tech company. It was really a big lobbying shop, right? Yeah. They put in a ton of money, and they just broke the taxi cartels all over the country. And that—that's what the real innovation was. It was the lobbying power that they had, and that they could—they could change the law in these places, right? By doing that, it, it's, break it for about three years and then change it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Then stop it. Nobody else comes in. Right, right, right. Um, but yeah, like I, I would think about it, and like if there's particular industries that you're interested in, that's where there's just a real big gap in terms of uh, in what we need, what law firms need. And for, I mean, for me, I think the big areas of innovation in the as lawyers that you're going to have to deal with one is we've spoken about just production, so using technology for kind of core power production of documents is happening already and it's just going to get smarter and smarter as AI makes its way into it. The second thing I think is transparency. I think customers, clients are demanding more and more transparency into what happens behind the closed door of, of the work that's happening and want to see where things are and, and so I think technologies that are going to make things more transparent. I think collaboration and interaction between all of the different stakeholders uh, between you and your clients, how you work together, and how the different constituents work together, the client, the investor, the lawyer, um, is technology is going to drive that. I think they're going to be new business models. I think that for some areas of law, the actual fundamental business model is broken. And I think you're going to see new business models coming into play. So I, I think it's... Um, 
it's a field ripe for disruption. I think it's a really exciting time to be a lawyer. I think it's always fun to be involved in something when it's being disrupted and when it's going through a lot of change. And um, so I, I, I think this is one of these industries, you know, five, 10 years from now, there's gonna, it, it's going to look very different. Let me, if I may, let me just ask a final question because I'm sure that if I don't, if we didn't ask it, it would come immediately. Um, I know we've got some members of uh, GW Law's uh, Entrepreneurship Law Society uh, uh, out there, perhaps some future members. Uh, for someone who is interested, who's in law school now, and who's interested in uh, this kind of practice, do you have any particular advice for what they should do? Uh, while they're in law school or during this period of their lives? Happy to. I guess I'll, I'll throw out some classes maybe. I don't even know. Some of them I'm sure exist. Some I assume exist. They didn't exist when I was there. But um, accounting and corporate finance, the extent you get exposure to that, um, somewhat uniquely amongst lawyers, that's critical to what we do because our clients don't have investment bankers. So we need to do a lot of that for them. Um, if you're interested in software type companies, anything around privacy is really key. Um, you know, IP as well, I and mean, copyright and you know, patents, it's a whole different subject, but you can do that. Um, and then, if there's any other classes I kind of wish I had taken. Tax drives a lot of what we do. I mean, most people are going to eventually take a class, a tax class, but I recommend that at a high level. Um, Securities regulation is like kind of what we do, but I feel like it's what I, that's what you do, you learn on the job. It's kind of the things that you touch tangentially, you need to be able to issue spot, that are almost more important to take the class for, because that's when you, you're not getting directly taught it at your job. Um, I don't know. Yeah, I would, I would try to find out, um, look, I think there's two things. One is when you're like a second year and you might not, you're picking your classes, you don't have your job yet. I would try to find things that you think are really interesting, right? Like, I remember taking gaming law, because I remember thinking that was interesting, and I realized, like, I don't think it's interesting at all. Like, it's, it's horrible, actually, and, like, these are terrible people. Uh, but there's, <laughs> there's other things, right, where you could take, like, different um, industry verticals and sort of find out what industries you might be interested in. Um, and then the other thing I tell people, especially when you're third year, like, you're going to work really, really hard when you're first, second, third year at a law firm. And, like, just try to, like, live your life and, like, bank that, like, personal capital with your significant other, your friends, things like that. Because, like, you're, you're, it's like you're going into a bunker for a few years when you started a law firm. So, like, you want to uh, build those relationships to last through that. You know, I think find a startup company that you can work with. Um, that you can see how you can help them. I think getting into the trenches is is kind of where the learning happens. The more business experience you can get in early on, you you have time to come back and bring that experience to your clients later. Um, so if there are a lot of students uh, at the different schools that are starting companies, already what you've learned is more than what they know in this area, and and um, just being on the team and, and rolling up your sleeves and seeing what you can do to help puts you, put you right there. So, you know, I think that's another thing that, that you, you can't buy and you can't learn in a book. Terrific. Let's throw the floor open to the, to, to the, the questions from the audience. Who's got a question for our panel? Yes, ma'am. Um, I'm really interested in this concept of um, of innovation in different regulatory areas. So, you know, you, you talked about securities. That's within a financial market that's extremely regulated, especially after the housing crisis. But then we juxtapose that across um, drones, right, where there's not a lot of regulation around drone airspace, and they're just trying to start grappling with that. Where do you think, um, in terms of a legal perspective, the most innovation happens? Or do you, do you slow down your, the companies that you work with in areas that are deregulated versus regulated? Or, or do you find the guardrails within a regulated market kind of helps you set them on a trajectory within their innovation of developing their products? Saying, hey, you know, this is where you need to stay within the bounds. Or does the unregulated market really say, just roll with it and we'll kind of handle the legal piece afterwards? Like, kind of talk about that. If I could just 
paraphrase that so we'll get onto, onto the video because the audience, the audio in the audience is not very good. Uh, the, but the question, as I heard it, was about the different approaches to uh, companies that are working in highly regulated areas versus uh, areas like drones where there's no regulations at all. And how does that affect your, your, your relationship with the companies and what you do for them? Um, it, it's... Uh... A lot of the best, really big businesses and best businesses are started in legal gray areas. And, and essentially what these businesses will often do is they'll, they'll exploit it and then they'll sort of pull up the ladder after them, right? So we do the same with Uber, but like you see Amazon with sales tax, right? And you see a lot of it in sort of different industries. So as a lawyer in a, in a gray regulation area, like there's risks there, right? Like you could also get like stopped, like the whole blockchain stuff, right? And and it's sort of over. But if you push into that and you can sort of come out the other side, there's often a lot of returns there. It's really hard. Like think about the restaurant business, right? It's really hard to start a business where there's really low barriers to entry. And and regulatory burdens are one of the biggest barriers to entry. Yeah, I, when Uber and Airbnb came out, which so it's an initial point, and you kind of made this point earlier, it's amazing how many industries that don't feel that regulated are highly regulated. Like the hotel industry is highly regulated. The cab industry is highly regulated. They're, they might not have these big federal laws. They're often like local regulations, which is you approach that differently than the way you would a federal regulation. But on the local regulation side, especially with those two companies, a number of my clients said, I don't need to pay attention to the local laws about that. You know, they didn't, right? And to your point, there's huge rewards if you come out on the other side, but no one who reads the stories about the company that got shut down when they were really small. Um, so it, it's partially a question of what's your game? Are you trying to really, kind of, if, you, if, you, if you take a regulated industry and you try to break it, that can be huge, but it's a much bigger risk as opposed to when you take an, an industry that is you know, either regulated, you try to you know, comply with it and work with regulators to kind of get it. it. It's a much lower risk, but probably a lower reward. And I guess the other point on that, because you mentioned drones, which is an example of this, there's two kinds of unregulated industries. There's those, it's kind of no good reason to regulate, right? Like a lot of enterprise software that helps you keep track of your, HR's got a little regulation, but whatever, keeps track of something. That's never going to be regulated. Drones will be. Right, they're, they've started. You know, they've they've passed some regulations around it. So I think you need to distinguish between a unregulated Wild West going to be regulated industry, which I think you approach differently than a this is just an unregulated industry and it never will be. There's no no real risk. And I, I think back to the the opportunity for reward in the about to be regulated industry. If you can kind of be part of, let's set the regulate help. Regulators often don't know the answer for what regulation should be. They, the good ones incorporate industry into their regulatory process. So if you get out ahead of that, you become an industry expert, you get involved with the rulemaking, and lo and behold, those rules happen to keep you afloat and, or in the air if you're a drone, and you know, maybe not everyone else. Uh, that, that can be real beneficial. You know, from a kind of coming into... The, the workforce, I mean, one of the interesting things about being in a space that is trying to do something very new is you're not very far behind everybody else who, who, you know, it's new for everyone. And so when you have new areas that are being kind of broken open by new business models and new technologies, similar to when, you know, when the whole token sale it, it came, came out and it kind of exploded last year, you had a lot of people all kind of scrambling at the same time, and there are people who've emerged as as kind of leaders in 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 the space, with a few years behind, just a few years under their belt. But they were they saw it three years ago, and everybody else saw it one year ago. So it is an opportunity to to kind of carve out a space for yourself very quickly. Ma'am, I, I see a hand. Um. So as lawyers in this space, you've already highlighted how you work across a lot of different subject matter and a lot of different industry areas. How does that shape how you network and build relationships? And going off of that, what kinds of associations or groups do you find that are really helpful for you outside of the office? So whether that's bar association groups, et cetera. 
again, if I can paraphrase, it, it's a question about networking and how, how important it is, how you do it, and what groups are particularly useful for that. You know, I think I, I just look back to when I was here in D.C. for law school, how little entrepreneurial activity was going on. I mean, it was, it was very, very little. Now, if you want to get involved in any sort of activity where entrepreneurs are gathering, there's almost, like, you can almost do it every day. I mean, there's something going on in the D.C. metro area, and then if you take a train ride to New York, I mean, between just those two markets, you could literally spend every day attending some events that are going on. So I, I just think look, looking less the bars, I mean, I don't do much with, you know, looking at the bar associations, but it's really looking at all of the different events that are going on for entrepreneurs and professionals who work with entrepreneurs and, and networking through those events. They're, they go on daily in DC now. Yeah, I'd say as a rule of thumb, look for the ones that have the least lawyers and the most business people, right? Like, I obviously love catching up with Derek. If I see him at an event, I'm like, man, he's here too, right? And he says the same thing. We, we want to be there with all the, the entrepreneurs only. And because of that, if you go to the events where all the really established companies are, there's going to be lots of other people there to meet them. And frankly, they're not at that event to meet you. Whereas you go to events that really target really young entrepreneurs, I shouldn't say young, early, early in the process, like just getting the business off the ground. A young lawyer can add value to them just in a quick conversation in the corner of that event, you know, answer a few questions. They love to get some free legal advice and they're happy to talk to you. 